uh, the, the speaker is uh, Justin McKinney, a, a, as Peter no noted, a previous presenter in the uh, speaker series and also at the, the, the FRED. Uh, Justin resides in uh, Calgary, Alberta, as, as I was wondering, that's his third province, and I think five years or something of that nature. He's, he's going to set the record, or at least the indoor record for it. He's been in what, British Columbia, Ontario, and Alberta. If I, and you may have more of it that for various reasons you, you don't want to say because you, <laughs> there may be wanted posters or something like that. Uh, Justin has been very active in uh, our committee activities for several years. Uh, and uh, recently has had his book, Baseball's Union Association, The Short, Strange Life of an Early Major League, uh, published by McFarlane and uh, won uh, uh, an award from uh, uh, Sabre as the best baseball book published that year. Uh, his work in the 19th century is also featured in the Biographical Committee's uh, newsletter periodically, where he has tracked down several missing players, added data to the uh, uh, base that they collect there. And just, uh, it, it's never easy when you've got a, you know, a guy named Williams who played one game for St. Louis in uh, 1888, and you're trying to figure out who the heck that is. Uh, but he has tracked down several of those folks. Tonight, his topic is the uh, the 1890 Philadelphia Athletics, how a pennant contender became the worst team of all time. So, Justin, if you want to uh, open your slides, uh, yes. you should be ready. Wonderful. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'll uh, get set up here. So just bear with me a moment. Okay. Can, can you, you all see the screen? screen? Can you go to full screen? There oh, you go. Good stuff. Magic. I've got a full screen on my side, so. There you go. So, yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, it's a provocative title, I know, so we'll get into it. Um, so a bit of background on the Philadelphia Athletics. This is the American Association iteration. Uh, they were one of the inaugural members in 1882, and they became the first major league team in Philadelphia since 1876 when the National League Club uh, disbanded. Um, and so big deal, return to one of the most popular cities in America. Uh, and they were successful right off the bat. Um, but in 1883, the Philadelphia Phillies uh, joined the National League to offer some competition, although right away they showed their true colors going 17 and 81. Um, Meanwhile, across town, the athletics, they won the 1883 pennant, they set an attendance record, and they cleared nearly $80,000 in profit, which was exceptional for the time. It was actually unprecedented um, how profitable this club was in 1883. It just proved that Philadelphia was a great baseball market. Um, and for the duration of the decade, they remained one of the stronger clubs in the league, but they never won another pennant. Um, sort of they bear a close resemblance to the the 1890s Phillies who always seem to be, you know, second or third place and very strong, but never quite could get there. Um, and another thing that happened as the decade proceeded is the Phillies improved. And yeah, eventually they would overtake the A's in attendance. Um, they became the dominant club in terms of the hearts and minds of uh, Philadelphia faithful. And that brings us to 1889. The A's finished in third place. Um, they were a very talented club filled with a bunch of herd hitters, but those herd hitters were also herd drinkers, and there was a lot of speculation that it may have cost them the pennant. And sort of the, the main kind of figurehead in the club um, who kind of guided the club through the decade uh, was a man named Billy Schlesig. He was born in 1855 in Philadelphia. He was a semi-pro player. Um, and he had helped found the Athletics as an independent club in 1880. And then he, along with Lou Simmons and Charlie Mason, brought the team into the American Association. So he's a key figure in re returning Major League Baseball back to Philadelphia. Um, in 1887, he bought out the other two owners and then partnered with um, a man named H.C. Pennypacker and William Whitaker, who um, would eventually kind of be very integral to what would happen in 1890. And Charlie himself took over field manager duties from 1888 to 1890. I guess field manager might be a misnomer, but he was involved in the day-to-day -day running of the club. 
And here's a photo of the 1883 pennant winner. So I'm sorry for the resolution, but uh, yeah, it's a fine photo showing some boiling men. And here is how they looked in 1889 when they finished in third place. And yeah, it's just some nice team photos there. So a few things happen that sort of lead us into what the 1890 season will become for the athletics. Um, first off, the Players League formed as a third major league. Large numbers of players defected from every club in baseball um, to the Players League. Uh, the A's were no different, no exception. They lost five regulars, um, including their top hitter in Harry Stovey and their top hitter in Gus Wing. But um, more concerningly, Philadelphia would also have a Players League team. So that meant there would be three major league teams in Philadelphia. And if 1884 is any indication when uh, the Phillies, the Athletics, and the Low League Keystones did battle, there was going to be someone who's going to come up short in the matter. Um, there was no way a team, a city to this point could had proven that they could support three major league teams and 1890 would prove to be no different. And here's a couple of the key defections uh, from the athletics on the left, there's Stovey and on the right, there's Gus Wayne, um, some fine old judge action there. And despite the losses of some key players, they were relatively less hard hit than other clubs. So going into the season, there was a lot of optimism that this club actually could be fairly competitive. Um, they were expected to be a contender, to be honest. Um, they were managed by Schoenzeich, and the opening day roster featured um, a handful of players who are even well-known today, including Wilbert Robertson, who's later in the Hall of Fame, Jack O'Brien, who was a, who's basically the best first, he's the first baseman for almost the entire duration of the Athletics franchise up to this point, Taylor Schaefer, who was the younger brother of Ordo Schaefer, who joined him in the outfield, um, he was a young prospect, uh, and then Ben Conroy, who was a teenage uh, infielder, uh, promising prospect, and then Denny Lyons, who was one of the best players in baseball at that point in time, a hard-hitting third baseman, who was a pretty good fielder as well. Uh, Blonnie Purcell was a longtime veteran, and Kurt Welch, um, who had just came to the come to the club recently from the St. Louis Brown Stockings, which had become a dynasty in the American Association. And then in pitching, they had Sadie McMahon, who was a young throwing her. Um, he was inexperienced, but had a lot of potential. And Ed Seward, who had proven himself to be an ace winning 35 games, I think in 1888 and 20-some games in 1889. So on paper, the team looked pretty good. There's obviously the middle and field looks a bit shaky just because of all the young players in there, but the rest of the lineup actually seems pretty solid. Um, so yeah, they had sort of a, a decent nucleus to at least compete in a weakened uh, American Association circuit. And on the left there is Danny Lyons um, with a scowl on his face. And then it's Robert Robertson uh, catching a fly ball uh, some 140 years later. It still hasn't come down. And then uh, Sadie McMahon in a fine portrait and tuxedo there. And he would later become uh, an ace for the Baltimore Orioles in the 1890s. So the club got off to a fast start. They jumped out to a 17-8 and eight record. Um, they took over first place on May 23rd. Uh, and... Despite the strong play, the attendance was proving to be a struggle. The Players League was making a huge impact um, in attendance across baseball. Any place where they were going up against an established club, the Players League was typically outdrawing um, the rival leagues. And so as an example, um, the home opener attendance for all three clubs, the Players League club drew 17,119 game, uh, 19 fans. The National League, the Phillies, they drew 6,952, and the American Association, the Athletics, they just drew 2,040 fans. And so that gives you a sense of the pecking order until the fan interest and um, everything else. The Players League was the strongest um, circuit based on the amount of players that defected. Numerous Hall of Fame caliber players and stars joined the Players League. And it was also novel as well. So fans would come out to see this new brand of baseball and see what it was. Um, and unfortunately, the American Association was definitely the weakest of the three leagues that saw play that year. And I think fans recognize that, the media recognize that. And so it was a self-perpetuating cycle that interest in the American Association, in particular athletics, was pretty tepid uh, for the most part. Um, and despite this lack of fan interest, um, the play of the club was very strong and they remained in first place into September. Um, the attendance did improve somewhat. Um, the, there was uh, 
season high uh, doubleheader on July 4th, I believe. It was where they drew 7,241 fans. That was a high mug for the season. And they swept it. They put the club 20 games above 500, and they now had a six-game lead in the pennant race. Um, but there were some red flags. Uh, Ed Seward, who I mentioned before, had been very effective in 1888-89. He was very ineffective and had some arm injuries and all that sort of stuff. So the club really had a lot of trouble with their pitching because they had no pitching depth. Uh, Sadie McMahon was pitching very effectively, but because of Seward's ineffectiveness, they had to use McMahon more often, and that resulted in him starting to suffer as well. His performance went down, and Scherzer, despite his best efforts, could not find a suitable replacement for Seward, and that ended up becoming a source of um, the troubles uh, on the field for the athletics. And so as the summer turns from July to August, uh, we start into the dog days, so to speak. And there's rumors of poor training habits um, on the team. Uh, McMahon starts to struggle and Seward was bad and every new pitcher they tried was absolutely awful. Um, meanwhile, the rival Louisville Colonels, who had finished in last place in 1889, um, ended up being very good in, in 1890 in large part because most of their players, are, the team is so poor that most of the players are not taken by the other leagues. And so they're actually able to be fairly competitive. Uh, and then meanwhile, they start to collapse. And Danny Lyons, he's in the middle of this MVP caliber season. He's hitting 354, 461, 531. He has a 193 OPS plus. Uh, he's absolutely an outstanding hitter, but um, he's one of the people on the team famous for blushing. And on August 28th, sort of it all comes to a head. Uh, Lyons shows up drunk to the puck. He makes four errors at third base, and then they fall 21 to eight uh, to Columbus. And so it's just an absolute disastrous game for Lions, disastrous game for the team. It really singles, symbolizes where the team is heading, and it's not to a good place. So the other thing that is happening as a result of this poor attendance is that Charles and uh, his fellow owners are losing money on the year because the attendance is pretty tepid. Um, they have to basically pay their players and try and keep the season going. They have to do all this sort of stuff to try and keep it afloat. But with these two other teams uh, playing against them, uh, it's very difficult to generate uh, the kind of income needed to keep the team afloat. And so there's actually rumors as well that there's financial mismanagement by co-owner and treasurer William Whitaker. Uh, this ends up being a big thing that goes on into the offseason where people are really uh, critical of Whitaker, saying he's the reason that the club uh, kind of ends up in disarray. And as I mentioned before, like the attendance issue is a big problem because the way the Players League was trying to compete was they were purposely scheduling games against the American Association of National League clubs at the same time and the other leagues were following suit. And so uh, I went through this the calendar for all three teams on the year, and there were 28 home games for the, American, the athletics that were played in opposition were, um, were either uh, the Phillies or the, the Players League Quakers were playing. And in 13 cases, there were 13 games where all three teams played at the same time. And uh, I went through and just figured out the average kind of fan attendance in these head-to-head -head competition games. And basically the players these game, they, they averaged 32, 63 fans. National League, uh, the Phillies averaged 29, 80, and the American Association once again comes up way behind, uh, averaging 1,476 fans during this head-to-head uh, -head competition. Um, and attendance kind of just falls apart as the club falls out of the race. So, you know, during June and July, they, they actually win a few of the head-to-head -head battles for attendance, but as the team kind of starts to struggle, it just really goes downhill. And so, as I mentioned, that August 28th game uh, where Lyons showed up drunk and was a disaster, Charlesley releases him immediately after for drunkenness. Um, and this was a pretty drastic measure to release your best player. Um, but given the club's financial state, it's in slide in the standings. Um, it was also kind of could be seen as a cost cutting measure because what good is Lions going to do you because you're already kind of out of the race. Um, and so by the end of August, they're going to put at least 17,000 in debt. There's over a month left to play and there's a costly Western Grove trip upcoming. And 
Um, as I've discussed at length in various other presentations about the Union Association, this was always the death knell for teams is they would finish the homestand, uh, take, uh, take all the income they could from fan attendance and then kind of disband or be at the risk of disbanding as a result of going on these long road trips where income was sparse and um, they would cost a lot to travel, accommodations, all that sort of stuff. And so it's no different in this case. And so uh, as a result, Charizard makes this uh, proposal to the team. Um, he says to his players that you can play with the rest of the season for a share of gate receipts, um, or you can be granted a release. And the, he knows that these star players, these high paid veterans are not gonna wanna play with the rest of the season for a share of gate receipts uh, because going on the road to be a bad team playing against other bad teams you're not going to make any money from the gate uh, playing a game between the Athletics and Toledo in September of 1890. There's not going to be anyone going to that game. So the players are not going to get the due salaries. And so he gave them the opportunity to ask for the release. And so every veteran player on the club was given a release, uh, which, again, is pretty drastic because that's well over half the team is now gone and you have to find replacements for them. Um, and... In an uh, interesting side note, the release of these players actually kind of is the first step in the building the Baltimore Oriole dynasty that kind of becomes the kind of team of the 1890s. Um, both Kurt Welsh, Sadie McMahon, and Wilbur Robinson all signed with Baltimore, um, and they yeah, become like key players as the team turns into uh, a super team uh, throughout that decade. So we have the athletics and Billy Shorzyk to thank and put for that. And so... Yeah, now we're left with a team that there's only a handful of players on the roster. Every veteran player is gone. There's a month left in the season. What What's one to do? And so uh, Scherzig, rather than disbanding the club, he, he signs a bunch of new players to replace the departed and finish out the season. Um, basically, he scours the local sand lots and grabs a few low-level minor leaguers who are from the area and says, hey, fellas, let's, uh, let's go on the road. Um, and they begin this road trip on September 18th. And so there's a month left in the season, about 15, uh, about 20, sorry, about 21 games left in the season. And uh, the newspaper is sort of christened this new squad, shows these amateurs. And so, uh, yeah, they're no longer the athletics, they're the amateurs. And so what happens when you get rid of a bunch of major league players and replace them with uh, people from the Sandlots? Well, we shall see. So this is the, the first uh, game of this uh, new season, uh, so to speak, September 18th, 1890. They play against Louisville, who has replaced the Athletics in uh, first place and would have actually gone to win the pennant, uh, becoming the first team to go from last place to first place uh, from one year to the next. And uh, if you see, uh, I think the bottom part here is cut off, but uh, the players in bold, that's the players who were on the athletics before shows a release of him, but not, only Conroy was a regular player and he was a 19 year old second baseman who was hitting 175 or something. He was not anyone of note. And the other players are all just local players who had been picked up to fill in and be deaf players. And then every new player here um, was recruited just because they didn't have other jobs and could go play baseball for a month. And only Pete Sweeney and Ed O'Neill had had major league experience previously. And both of those, it was a very minuscule amount of major league experience. So you have this new team where there's not a lot of star power. There's no evidence of any sort of promise, but maybe they can win a game or two, right? Like the worst team still wins, you know, 33% of the games. So, yeah. But as you can see, this opening game, they lose nine to four to Louisville. So could be worse, but you know, it's not a bad showing for a bunch of players who never played together. Um, Ed Green, he's one of the pullovers. Um, he pitched uh, the first game of the doubleheader the next day on September 20th, and he loses, uh, he gives up 22 runs, and they lose 22 to four. And then William Stecker, who's another one of the pitchers who, again, is still with the club after all the releases, he loses 10 nothing in game two. Uh, and then another doubleheader in Louisville. On September 21st, uh, Ed O'Neill loses 12 to 4, and then Stecker loses 16 to 3. And so you, you see a pattern here. The team is bad. 
woefully unable to compete. They have no pitching. They have no hitting. And then there's also this interesting fact that as we go on the road, teams are just jamming double headers together because they just want the athletics to get out of town because there's no there's no interest in seeing this club uh, at this point in the kind of dismal state. And then they moved on to St. Louis and they lose by a score of 21 to 2, 15 3 to 7 to 3. And they do pick up a local player called Ed Paps to play left field from St. Louis. So hey, maybe he'll make a difference. Um, but yeah, it's not looking good. They've now lost their first handful of games by absolutely appalling scores. And yeah, they move on. So they head over to Toledo. Uh, Toledo was the American Association's fourth place club. They were not bad. Um, and then, yeah, they proceed to play three games in two days, losing 15 to three, 11 to nine, and 15 to one. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, they these doubleheaders proliferate as the the Shirley's League's amateurs come to town because, again, no one wants anything to do with them. It's kind of an embarrassment to baseball, to be honest. Uh, and then they head off to visit Columbus. Um, and that team finished in second place in the American Association that year behind Louisville. Um, and HXC Athletics also struggle. They go 14, who lose games 14 to 2, 14 to nothing, and 9 to 2. Uh, in Columbus, they actually tried a local battery in the final game with no success. William Lackey was a Columbus pitcher. Um, and his catcher is in the box was known as only as Macy. Um, uh, Peter Morris has found a reasonable candidate for him, but it's a man named Patrick Millay who was William Lackey's battery mate on a semi-pro club in the city. But in all the box scores for the game, it's the catcher is just listed as Macy. So we just have no way to kind of put two and two together. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not looking good. They just keep finding players um, in hopes that someone can do something, but uh, no one can do anything. And then, uh, yeah, they head out to Syracuse for the final four games on the road trip, and then they're going to return home. Um, and, yeah, they play a doubleheader on October 4th. Um, Ed Pabst, who had actually been one of the only players who, I guess, had a pulse, he had 408 games with three stolen bases, um, but he left the club to go join St. Louis. So uh, didn't didn't want to stick around and and uh, see, see the horror that was coming uh, over the final week of the season. And Syracuse was one of the weakest teams in the league. And the amateurs actually almost won uh, the first game of the doubleheader. They fell by a score of seven to six, um, but then they dropped game two by their customary uh, score of six to one. And then they head back to Philly for the final homestand. And as you can expect, uh, fan interest was minimal. Um, so they're going to play Rochester in game one on October 8th. Uh, they lost 17 to one in front of 50 fans. So um yeah not not a lot of interest in seeing the slaughter um and rochester obviously doesn't have a whole lot going on for itself uh and then they lost game two on the ninth by a square 10 to 4 and then they're swept by uh syracuse in a doubleheader uh on october 11th by a square 16 to 1 and 15 to 4 and then that brings us to the season's uh, final game on october 12th and this is a large reason why I'm so fascinated by this club. It's this weird, strange game that happened on October 12th, 1890 uh, in Gloucester, New Jersey. Um, Philadelphia still had the Sunday blue laws in effect, so baseball could not be played within Philadelphia on a Sunday. So the athletics took to playing the games on Sundays in Gloucester um, across the river. And yeah, there was 20 people estimated to be in attendance for this final game. Um, it ended up being 12 to 2, shellacking in five innings by visiting Syracuse. There's no evidence of why the game was stopped, but I suspect the fact that it's 12 to 2, there's 20 people in the crowd. It's October 12th on a Sunday, final game of the season. There's really no interest in keeping the game going. It's just, it's just like it's like mercy rule, so to speak. Um, and what makes this game so fascinating to me is that four members of the athletics lineup that day remain unidentified. So there's a player named Crawford uh, who played uh, in uh, shortstop in this game. He's listed in the baseball reference in the encyclopedia as George Crawford, but there's no evidence of where the first name came from. It's likely he's conflated with a minor league player from the mid-1880s named George Crawford, but don't have anything on him. Um, he was a local player from either New Jersey or Philadelphia, but I've been unable to pin down a first name for him. And then the outfield, uh, the famed outfield, you could say one of the greatest in major league history, really, of Swagger in left field, uh, Nick Pride in center field, and Stafford in right field. There's absolutely zero information on either man. Um, I've not found anything that points to who these guys were. I've gone through the Camden and Gloucester city directories. I've looked through 
Camden Papers, Philadelphia Papers. And while there is a handful of players named Stafford, a handful of players named McBride playing semi-pro ball in Philadelphia at the time, there's nothing that links them to this. And I suspect the local players from Gloucester who were playing on a semi-pro team, but nothing has come up. And Swigert is an unusual name. You figure there might be something, but there's been absolutely nothing. And so, yeah, it's just kind of... Uh, uh, a disaster as far as um, biographical research goes. And the starting pitcher is a pitcher named John Sterling. He was only finally identified this year. Um, he had been long suspected he had been a, a, there's a pitcher from Camden who pitched in minor league ball and had a trial with the St. Louis. Uh, Brown Stockings like, didn't actually play, but he was on the roster for a little bit in uh, the previous year. And we finally nailed down that it's actually him who pitched this game. But Again, it took 100, you know, 33 years to just find a guy's first name and confirm it's him. So, yeah, there's these four mystery players who um, I think may take another 130 years to uh, identify. So if you have any leads, please send them my way. So, yeah, so this disaster game concludes the season. They lose 12-2. to two. Um, And you might be asking, look, was there anyone who had any redeeming qualities as a player uh, of Shrozik's misfits, Shrozik's amateurs. Um, I'll point out that only Joe catcher Joe Daly appeared in the major leagues post-1890. Um, and he, he played a total of three games over two seasons in 1891 and 1892. Um, his older brother was Tom Daly, who was a pretty well-known catcher, um, but Joe Daly could not stick in the majors. Um, and that's the only player of, the, of Shrozik's amateurs who appeared in the major leagues after 1890. Um, there's a few players who have some interesting uh, potential, uh, namely Charles Schneider, who I've, I wrote a, a blog about a few years ago. Um, he was a 17-year-old catcher, I think, to date. He's the second youngest player to appear at catcher in a major league game. Um, he had 273 um, in his stint with the club, uh, but he had a minor league career destroyed by alcoholism, and he was dead before age 30. Um, and then Crawford, as I've mentioned, he was an infielder, outfielder, um, but he received high praise for his defense in the papers. I don't know if it was just them kind of poking fun or making fun of him, but it seemed like he had something. And Scherzig actually used him on his several minor league clubs and semi-pro clubs in the ensuing years. But every single team listing I found for one of Scherzig's clubs, it omits his first name. And there's a couple players named Crawford playing at the same time. There's a George Crawford and a Henry Crawford. But not clear which one's which. Um, and so, yeah, it remains unidentified. And then Andy Knox was a six foot five uh, first baseman, which is a veritable giant in uh, 1890. And he had a 330 on base percentage and five steals and eight OBIs and nine walks. And he had a minor league career for a few years after. So he's at least a, you know, remotely <laughs> competent player. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot to offer there. And uh, it's not, not surprising that if you were to just release your roster and try and fill them with replacements in September in a season when there's three major leagues, like almost every player who has a pulse can do anything is taken up. So it's not surprising you'd have trouble filling out a roster with competent players. And so the aftermath of this disastrous season, um, the club dis disbanded immediately. Um, uh, basically, yeah, it was just seemed like we've lost too much money. This, this whole final month was a total sham. Uh, the Players League collapsed in the offseason for a variety of reasons, mostly uh, due to financial kind of implications and, and some law maneuvering by the National League. Uh, the Quakers actually joined from the Players League to join the American Association to replace the athletics in 1891 in the American Association. Um, and they took on the athletics name. Uh, and Scherzig was actually the manager of that club. Uh, Scherzig was absolutely a beloved figure in baseball in Philadelphia incredibly well respected and every single account I've read of him in this final month of the season where the team is absolutely in shambles no one's pinned it on our shows like they're, they're all like that Whitaker guy blew all the money like it's not shows fault he's a good person a good guy trustworthy reputable um so it was, it was interesting and then he got this chance to manage the athletics in 1891 but he got let go after a 6 11 start uh, he went on to manage the minor league clubs. And then in 1901, he was hired by Connie Mack as the American League Athletics uh, business manager. Um, and again, it points to how well respected he was in the baseball world. But unfortunately, he died shortly after, on uh, February 1st, 1902. 
Um, so yeah, Scherzig is not to blame for this disaster of the season. But that brings us to what you've all been wondering. How how could we say this pennant contending team is the worst team of all time? They they finished 54 and 78 on the season. You know, they were the worst team in the league by record, all sort of stuff. But there is a way to look at it that I think paints a pretty ugly picture. So, yeah, I will make the case that the Scherzig amateurs are the worst baseball team in Major League history, but we make the special caveat that it's only the games from September 18th to the end of the season, because that's when they released the majority of the players who replaced them with Sam Lauders. That version of the club went 0-21. They scored 59 runs in those 21 games, and they allowed 273 runs. No team in Major League history has ever allowed more runs or posted a worst run differential over a 21-game stretch. Um, the 20th century record is uh, 202 runs allowed over 21 games by the 1930 Phillies. They meant to do that, I think, twice in a season. Um, but 273 is just absolutely astronomical, and no team's ever done that, and no team ever will do that. So here's hoping anyway. Um, and then I so I made this little chart to put it in context. Um, I included the Brooklyn Atlantics of the National Association in the final season. Because that club went two and forty-two, and although the National Association not officially recognized as major league, I just want to point out just how how bad these athletics were. Um, yeah, so you see that they uh, fifty-nine runs scored, two seventy-three allowed. Pittsburgh in the National League that year um, had suffered mass defections of almost every good player on the club, and that team was also abysmal. They had 100 runs scored and allowed 265 over a 21 game stretch. Um, the Atlantics had 60 and 227 over uh, a 21 game stretch, uh, the worst 21 game stretch. Louisville, the previous year, who would, would win the pen in 1890, they had 100 runs and 201 runs allowed. And as a benchmark, um, the Cleveland infants, Cleveland spiders, Cleveland, uh, whatever you want to call them, in 1899, which is generally considered the worst baseball team of all time. All time. Uh, going, uh, I believe, 20 and 134, something like that. Uh, during their worst, absolute worst stretch, uh, they allowed, they scored 58 runs, which actually bests the American Association by one run, but uh, they allowed just, they allowed 199. So during their worst stretch, they were still not as bad as the Philadelphia Athletics. And that sort of brings me to the close. Um, this is unrelated, but I did write a book um, and some people liked it. So, um, yeah, I will stop there, um, but I'm around uh, active online if people want to get in touch with me about stuff. So I'll stop sharing um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Justin, thank you. Uh, it, it's a fascinating period where, for individual teams with the uh, uh, well, Players League and uh, various other things going on. Uh, there were several uh, questions that we you can uh, comment on. Uh, Matt Albertson being a, a true Philadelphian and understanding why you need to be at the bottom of the uh, uh, standing said uh, the 17 and 81, my kind of team. So we've got... Uh, We'll, we'll hear from Matt here in a little later. Bill Felber asks, the 1890 uh, attendance figures are considered notoriously in, inflated. How comfortable are you with the, the attendance figures you cite? Um, well, I can say that I don't think the American Association ones are particularly inflated because they are almost universally way behind the National League and Players League. So I suspect that um, I'm just going by, I was able to find the tennis records in the contemporary papers at the time. So uh, I have no doubt that the American Association, the athletics had the worst attendance of the three Philadelphia clubs. At the very least, I feel comfortable saying that. Um, as for the inflatedness of it, I know they were running them in different places. I know, I think you can find where the standings will be listing the uh, the attendance figures beside the, beside the standings. And it's very fascinating, but yeah, so I would just, I feel comfortable saying the athletics were definitely not well attended. Um, yeah, by any, stretch, by any stretch of the imagination. All right, uh, uh, Stu Thornley brings us into some uh, uh, current popular culture here. I don't know if any other Seinfeld fans perked up seeing the name H.C. Pennypacker, since Pennypacker was one of Kramer's aliases. Uh, I looked it up and Kramer used H.E. Pennypacker. 
<laughs> now I have tracked down the derivation of Kramer's alias, and I'd, I'd love it if that came from the 1890 athletics. Uh, That'd be a and, deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> Filthy yeah. old uh, noticed that uh, also. Uh, that Albert, uh, keeping with the uh, uh, theme here of, of uh, things that happened so well, wow, Don Carmen went from an 1890s Philadelphia shortstop to a 1980s Philadelphia starting pitching pitcher. I, I think we, we all know that he's a great, great grand nephew of uh, uh, one Don Carmen and uh, uh, I, I, I think I remember actually, where I, he's from is, is Carmen well, he was from California I think I I I think I may have put a typo in there it's actually George Carmen who was the 1890 athletics player so uh, I, so, maybe, I, so maybe he's a, a yeah. great uncle or something he could be yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry about that I probably had Don Carmen on my mind I had his he had that list of stock quotes I probably read that at the time I was doing that, you know? <laughs> Uh, in the uh, uh, box score you showed with the uh, the Louisville game, uh, Jeff Warner uh, notes that there were uh, 10 unearned uh, uh, runs. And I think some others noted that uh, uh, there weren't a lot of, of, of errors in that game. Uh, and so, some were speculating uh, uh, pass balls and things of that nature. Uh, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, let me have Game a look. Or, or was it just a typo that um, they lost count? Yeah, it's two and runs, one and run in the 9 4 game. Uh, I'm just looking for errors. Yeah, there's not a ton of errors. Um, yeah, it's hard to reconstruct exactly what happened. There was a bunch of walks and a hit by pitch. Uh, and Jewett Meekin struck out 11 batters, but um, <laughs> I don't have any intel on how the runs were scored. but Sloppy baseball is to be expected. But yeah, the lack of errors in the box for it, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe they were just perfectly timed errors that would cause all these runs to score. I'm not sure. So. Uh, 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 Matt uh, uh, joins in here wondering about uh, the, the McBride character who we have no information on from the uh, 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 late season game. Wonder if it's possible that Dick McBride took a crook. Across, came across the river to play. He would have been a tender 43 in 1890. Uh, although I wonder what he was an outfield that the McBride you're talking about was an outfield. Yeah, he was an outfielder. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Dick McBride was fundamentally a pitcher. And if they had got him out there, they would have prayed that the arm wouldn't fall off a lot of pitch. Yeah. He also played outfield on occasion too. So yeah. it's the last, it's the last game of the season. It's a Sunday game. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, it's probably not him, but the, the potential that he is jumping across the river just to help out Billy Sharsig, uh, who has been in the Philadelphia baseball scene since Dick was in the Philadelphia baseball scene is a titillating idea. Yeah, it, I mean, that's a possibility. I think given his stature within Philadelphia, I suspect they would have made note of it if it was a player of, of any sort of substance. Um, but yeah, who, who knows, right? It's like, that's, that's, I... I, th I think I wrote about this for the article for, for the Sabre Philly thing, but just that if I could travel back in time, I would just go back to this game and just, just ask people their first names. That's that's what I would do. I wouldn't, no other baseball thing interests me. I just want to go see that happen. You know, just find out who these misfits in the outfield are. Uh, Tony Mollica asked a, a point on one of the box scores where the A's were on the uh, left of the uh, uh, box score. Uh, and why, if they were the home team, Matt Albertson commented on that, saying the home team uh, batted glass wasn't a rule until the uh, until 1950. But uh, do, are you familiar with the rule on who batted first and how they would determine that? Uh, I don't know in the American Association at that point what if it was just manager's choice or they flipped a coin. I, I I don't know the mechanics of how that would happen. But yeah, I know it wasn't wasn't written in stone that you have to do this so do that i think yeah one of the things i i, I think nationally and it may have been uh, america so they, i think the home team manager got to pick okay yeah. there, there was an article in the uh, baseball research journal about two years ago on um, batting choosing to bat first and how that was the strat perceived strategy into the 
teens, maybe the twenties, mm. uh, and it it didn't become. It took a long time to evolve into let's stay it as the it best to get the last wraps. Mm. Uh, let's say we got a few others here. Uh, uh, Paps, uh, this is from uh, Chris Betch. Uh, Paps didn't show up in the majors again, uh, but besides the uh, his great names, at, at least maybe Denny Lyons liked it yeah. for the, the beer uh, choice. Uh, he had a nice career in the uh, minors, including managing the Atlanta club later. So mm. as you say, just because they were a terrible major league player, yeah, he they keep... found a way through the minors to keep playing for some years. Yeah, I think he was actually a pretty talented player. It's just he was from St. Louis and probably got picked up for this, and then he wasn't under contract, so he probably just jumped when he got a different offer, whatever. I mean, he might have preferred to stay in St. Louis or whatever, but uh, yeah, he, he actually seemed to have a bit of ability for sure. Okay. Um, how did, okay, here's a great uh, from Bill Felber. With his known luxury, uh, how did Lions catch on after 1890? Well, because he could hit. <laughs> if you could hit, you could hit. I mean, people, people overlook a lot, of, a lot of things, you know. Like, uh, Covers all sins, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and it was that time, it was, you know, what great player in baseball wasn't a drinking man at that point in time, right? There's only a handful of them. So he's put up with it. I, I think his. His release from the athletics was more due to money than it was that, but that was just a convenient kind of like, okay, well, this is just bad. <laughs> this is, we have a reason to get rid of him, all that sort of stuff. And there was rumors throughout the rest of the season that he would join the Chicago Players League Club, but then he never ended up signing. And then he, uh, I forget where he ends up in 1891, but yeah, he's. Uh, Justin, yeah, he's, that actually leads to a question I've been kicking around. We, you were talking about luxury as kind of a, a, a disincentive or a problem. But wasn't it for this team? But wasn't it actually fairly common then? Uh, yeah, it, it, oh, it definitely was. But the athletics in particular had had a reputation for quite a few years as being underachieving due to this problem. And Jose was, for, as respect as he was, I think he was a he was a player's manager, and I think he wasn't you know necessarily going to be the guy to keep these guys in line. He was you know going to kind of go with the flow on things, and so I think. Um, yeah, it was just they had that reputation, and I think there's, I think um, there's a good article by Craig Brown uh, on Threads for a Game about the athletics and and the the temperance kind of movement on the team and things like that in the eighteen and nineties season. And so, yeah, but they they just had that reputation in eighteen ninety kind of proved no different. Uh, we've got the. Uh, I was just just thinking about the the drink. Chicago National League team was always the the. Uh, Spalding particularly was the anti-drinking yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, master there, although he would sign players if they were really good, yeah. uh, have them sign the pledge, I won't, won't drink, which, which yeah, lasted yeah. 20 minutes or so, and uh, off they would, would go. So I, I back to your answer as he could hit, yeah. was tended to be the, uh, the, the critical factor in those decisions. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, one of my favorites, you know, uh, Pete Browning. He signed the pledge every year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, well, he hit three. He'd hit three fifty, and they'd yeah. sign him again. He'd sign the pledge. I won't drink. You know, yeah. By the beginning of May, he's off to West Baden Springs to dry out. Yeah. Well, and and the big issue that comes down is like you have players showing up and not being performing, but you also have players who would like disappear for weeks at a time because they've gone to bender and like. You just know who you didn't know who would be short off the puck on a given day just because of the nature of some of these guys. And so it just, you know, that ended up being a whole thing that dominated 19th century baseball. Uh, Jack Bales gives us the, the definitive answer on the of batting first, batting second in the uh, 1880s. Uh, and he cites David uh, Nemec in his book on the American Association that in 1885, there was a rule change gave the choice of whether to bat first or last to the captain of the home team. Mm, okay, okay. I like that. Yeah, I talked about that book in a book discussion group, and it just stuck with me, and so I just checked real quickly, and I saw it there. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Uh, quick question. 
but but I think also that that baseball research journal article when the home team had the choice many many times they chose to bat first Mm -hmm. Mm because they thought it was better to get a clean ball oh yeah score first all sorts of things good because i would guess when uh, their pitcher would get in there and start to spit on that ball and (laughs) ground it into the dirt and what who knows the ball's harder earlier on yeah. in the game and especially when you're yeah. using trying to use one ball during a game yeah. um oh, yeah. that matters yeah um i did have a quick question justin uh yeah. you have you have richard hershberger's newspaper scans yes yeah i do yeah yeah okay i just i thought so i just wanted to make sure yeah yeah i i yeah this the the city item is mm-hmm. just indispensable like really yeah. really good coverage and yeah good coverage of this weird 1890 season so yeah and uh, just a point of order, you mentioned uh, an old judge card of Ju- uh, Gus Wayne. Uh, that was actually Sam Thompson. Oh, that was Sam Thompson? Okay. My That's apologies. Sam Thompson. Yeah, they uh, they kind of, they took his Detroit Wolverines picture. Yeah, and the, I see. 1887 yeah, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then threw on Philadelphia because he joined the Phillies after. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I saw, I didn't do the due diligence to double check the, the citation of who the photo was, but much appreciated. Thank you. I I think that's the end of the questions. If there's anybody else that's got something. Yes, really quick. Um, while I was just spelunking through the city item of October 13th, 1890, yep. I took note of a benefit game for Billy Sharsig yep. between the Players League Club in Philadelphia and the previous year Philadelphia Athletics yep. and the October 14th uh, edition actually gives us um, of the Philadelphia record actually gives us uh, a rundown on the players that will be in the lineup for the athletics um, from the previous year. And it's actually guys from the previous year's team. So like the guys that have been gone, released, whatever, some of yeah. them are coming back to play in a benefit game. Yeah. 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 I think that speaks to show and how well like he was. And then I, I remember trying to find that game. I think it takes place like a week later. Cause I think there's a bunch of inclement weather and stuff. And then they finally take place. And I, I don't recall exactly the outcome, but I think it was pretty modestly attended just cause it's a baseball game in late October in Philadelphia. And yeah. What's what's the reason for the benefit? Is it because Billy had to deal with this travesty of a team, or yeah, or yeah, I think, uh, yeah, because like I think as a result of like the the club being seventeen thousand dollars in debt and things like that, and he's an owner in the club and all these sort of things. So I think it's like yeah, help him out because he, yeah, he's a really yeah really well respected guy. Like I couldn't find anyone saying anything bad about him. Like everything is very pro Billy Shaw. So. Oh, one last night you had the that list of ba- bad teams. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, and uh, the history of, of of baseball in the 1890 uh, Pittsburgh yeah, yeah. team uh, was was just really awful. Uh, yeah, 23 and 113, I think. Yeah, and, and they were the 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 second team to lose 100 games uh, in a in a season. But their manager was a member of Louisville when they lost a hundred games. <laughs> who had been released late July uh, uh, or uh, middle of August. Mm. He was Guy Hacker. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I saw he's on the eighteen ninety roster. Yeah, but I hadn't realized. Yeah, he, he was, was on eighteen ninety nine as well. And he and that was his that was his uh, home area, is Western Pennsylvania. Came from yeah, yeah, City. yeah. So, uh, uh, thank every thank everybody for coming tonight, and thank you, Justin, for a, a really fascinating uh, presentation here. To of, of what it, it's a little different how how teams react to a bad season. Yeah. Here's one that just said goodbye to everybody who was getting more than I don't know hundred dollars yeah yeah a month yeah. or something like that. Uh, and we'll just pull somebody out of the stands or whatever yeah. we can do for uh, Tuesday's game. Uh, and it, it's fascinating where the other guys went. And I think it's an interesting story of uh, a side note in the build, building of the old Orioles. In the yeah, Olympics. yeah, yeah. I was surprised to find that. Yeah, that was a neat little, little thing that connects it to something bigger. Very good. Well, thank you again. Peter, if you'd like to give us our clothes, and we'll... Okay. Okay, well, Justin, that was wonderful. It was a great presentation. When I saw the slides about a week ago, 
I knew it was going to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're going to continue next month on December the 12th. And uh, we're going to have Gregory Wolf, who was actually supposed to give this presentation about a year ago. And he had a, uh, a kind of an emergency duty to fulfill that work. Oh. And uh, I think, Bob, I think you filled in for him, didn't you? Or... I did. Yes, I remember that. And uh, anyway... Uh, he's going to be doing his uh, initial presentation that he had planned for a year ago on uh, Bill Hutchinson. He, he calls a forgotten star standing five, 55 and a half feet from home plate uh, back in the day. Uh, and uh, he, he's going to talk about Hutchinson and uh, how the, uh, a little bit about how they, uh, the pitching distance of 1893 kind of upended him. But uh so we're looking forward to Gregory on December the 12th. Uh, all of you, I know, uh, just so because we have a little bit of an audience here still, that uh, we uh, keep your eye on your emails that are coming out of uh, the 19th Century Committee. There'll be a couple of announcements, uh, one having to do with a new Facebook initiative. Uh, and a couple, we have a couple of our guys on here tonight that were involved in that. And also... Um, the FRED registration will be different this year, only in the fact that it will be an online process. And uh, But you will receive in your newsletter the normal uh, imaging, the normal paperwork for your own notes to uh. help, uh, help you do the online process. So anyway, uh, but there'll be some emails coming out about that. And uh, on behalf of uh, myself and uh, Bob Bailey and John Popovich is here tonight. And, uh, I want to thank you all uh, for uh, tuning in for the uh, 19th Century Baseball Speaker Series. Thank you again, guys. Thanks, Have a nice Justin, Thanksgiving. Peter, we'll Bob. see you next month. Good night. Bye now. Thanks, Justin. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.